Micah chapter 7, and we're going to begin reading in verse 14. Micah chapter 7, beginning in verse 14. The Bible says, Feed thy people with thy rod, the flock of thine inheritance, which dwell solitarily in the wood. In the midst of Carmel, let them feed, in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old. According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, will I shew unto him marvelous things. The nations shall see and be confounded at all their might, and they shall lay their hand upon their mouth, and their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall move out of their holes like the worms of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall fear because of thee. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression and of the remitted heritage of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our infirmities, that will, and thou will cast all their sin into the depths of the sea. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and your watch care. God, we help, pray for your help this morning. We pray that you'd get a hold of us as a people, that you'd cause our hearts to be sorry uh, for sin in our lives. We pray that you would uh, convict the lost, Lord, that you'd make them an understand and know that you are the Savior. You are, uh, you are the kind one. You're the one at their beck and call, Lord. We pray for that. God, help us to preach what you've given us, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all, for it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, uh, maybe some not so familiar scripture, except for maybe verse 19, when he promises to cast our sins in the depths of the sea. In other words, as far as they can be from us, that's where our sin is at. Uh, that's what forgiveness is about. You know why when people genuinely, truly get saved, they become different creatures? It's because their sin is in the depths of the sea. It, it's gone. It's no longer a hindrance or a bother to them. Their sins are in the depths of the sea. Now, we'll go back to verse 14, and I want you to see, and you can read the rest of Micah to, uh, this week if you want to, but essentially, like most of the Old Testament prophets, it explains why Israel got into the condition that it did, and it's always sin. Uh, you know, why we get in the condition that we're in, it's because of sin. And then when you get into sin, the next thing is coldness. You, you don't hear from God like you used to. And then after you get cold, then you leave God. He don't leave you, but you can leave Him. I don't mean in redemption, but I mean in fellowship. You can leave God. You know why people don't rejoice in the Lord anymore? Well, this is the reason. is because they have left God. They're, they're no longer near unto him. And, and so there's really nothing to rejoice about. So the little book of Micah is not much different than that. And it, and it records the story of Israel's rebellion. Uh, verse 14, we'll go back there. Feed thy people with thy rod. Now, as every Sunday is, we're fixing to go downstairs and eat us a meal together. And you get excited about that. You see little things that the women bring in and put there on the table and preparations are made. But I want you to see his meal for Israel at that time was the rod. Now, I believe every family should have a true rod. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, the rod was whatever mama could get her hands on. 
And uh, that, that took care of the problem. Uh, uh, I remember the worst whipping I ever got was with a Pacifia. Because that thing would wrap around your leg. When you pulled it back, it, it felt like you was taking hind hair at all. And, uh, but you know what? It did the job. Now, with that said, you know, most people today don't even whip their children. No. You know what? Uh, this is the thing with mine. I'm going to whip them. And if the government don't like it, they'll just have to deal with it. Now, you can take that too far. You shouldn't beat your children. Uh, but uh, Bella had to have an attitude adjustment this morning. And you know what? Uh, Donna adjusted it. And we, as a people, are the very same way. We need an attitude adjustment sometimes. Uh, we, we need to regain our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's left us here to do. And we just need that. So he says, your meal is going to be the rod. Your meal is going to be correction. Your meal is going to be something that will make you a better person when you're done, but you may not like it when you eat it. That's what the rod is about. So he says, feed thy people with thy rod, the flock of thine heritage. Now I want you to know, notice that this rod is not for everybody. The rod is for his heritage. You know what? Bunch of children in the building this morning. You know what? The ones I'm going to whip is the ones that belong to me. Yeah. If Emma wants to turn the building up on its side, that's between her and Jared. It don't have anything to do with me. Right? Because she's not mine. Uh, my, my inheritance is over here, and that's the ones I am responsible for, and our Lord God is the same very way. So I want you to say, see that this, this meal of the rod, or this meal of correction, is just for his people. You know, uh, when I was a kid, and I understand it now, I always heard, well, they live like dogs and have everything they want. I don't understand it. Well, you, you understand it, but the first thing, they live like dogs because they are dogs, and they don't belong to Christ, and he's not going to correct them. They don't belong to him. Uh, that'd be just like me whipping somebody else's child. It's not my spot to do. And so the Lord God reminds them and says, Listen, uh, you're my flock, and I've got to correct you. I've got to give you a whipping. The flock of thine inheritance... Which dwell, which dwell solitarily or alone in the wood. Now we get to a problem in verse 14 because we find that the Lord God's people are to dwell solitarily. They stick to themselves. Now, that don't mean we can't have friends, but you know what? Where your best friends ought to be, they ought to be right here. The ones that you call in time of trouble, they, because you see, worldly, ungodly friends will take you in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. So he says, yeah, you're going to be out there in the middle of the wilderness, and I want you to dwell solitarily. I want you to dwell by yourself. You know, what I found among God's people, and you can let this be uh, your measuring stick this morning, is it okay for you to be by yourself? Uh, in your by yourself time, if all you do is turn on the TV, uh, you're not dwelling solitarily. And that mess on most of TV is not to your benefit. You're not dwelling. Uh, how comfortable are you with you in just prayer? That's dwelling solitarily when it's just you and God and you're in prayer. Most people feel very uncomfortable with that. But I want you to see that it was the position that God ordained for Israel when they were out in the countryside was to stay away from the people that had bad influence on them to dwell solitarily. Then he says, in the midst of Middle Carmel, let them feed in Bashan. Now remember what the meal is. The meal is a fried chicken. The meal is not a chocolate pie. The meal is correction. 
The meal that he had was the rod. And he says, when they're out there in the middle of nowhere doing what they know is wrong, let them get a big old heap of the rod. Get them, let them have a heap of correction. And that's what he, had, he always does. Feed in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old, according to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt. Uh, you know what? When they came out, they were a different people. They'd been down there with the Egyptians so long that the Egyptian customs was intermingled with theirs, and they were no longer a single people except as a slave. And, and uh, he, he called them out. He said, Moses, I want you to lead them out, lead my people to a land which I shall show you. He didn't have the end destination. All he said was, follow me. You know what? We don't have our end destinations yet, but we need to keep following him. Right. Uh, we don't need to give up on that. And so, as, uh, as, Nate, uh, as the writer Micah is recording this, he says, let them have their fill. According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, will I shew unto them marvelous things. Now, he changes the diet. He, he changes what's on the table. Uh, been married as long as me and Donna been married. You eat whatever's there. And you don't make faces. And you tell her how good it is. And, you know, happy, happy wife, happy life. And uh, so uh, he says he's changed the menu. He says, I'm going to feed you differently. They, they got the rod of correction. They had had that meal. And then he said, I'm going to show you some miraculous things. I'm going to show you some unbelievable, uh, uh, some unbelievable things to put before you, something else to feed on. According to the days of the coming out of the land, I will show you marvelous things. Things that are a marvel, that a very close, uh, a very close thing to that is a miracle. Uh, I'm going to show you marvelous things. You know, you think about the years of your life, and you see how good God's been to you, and how many marvelous, marvelous things He's done. That's what we got to eat. <laughs> But you know what? Very frequently, you're like, well, I haven't had much of that. Well, maybe you have to eat a little bit more rod of correction. You know what? Uh, that marvelous meal is for people who are obeying God. And the rebellious meal is for people who are in rebellion. And, and so sometimes while the Word of God don't taste so good at preaching time, and it maybe don't thrill our heart like it ought to, the reason for that is the meal being served. And God's in control of that. In verse 16, The nations shall see and be confounded at all their might. Now as the children of Israel were leaving Egypt, and, and, and as long as they were on God's plan, do you remember uh, they would say, this is a, uh, an exceeding great people. What shall we do? They were, they were fearful of them. See, when, when God's people really get on barometer with God, and they're, 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 on, they're on point with each other, it scares the fire out of the devil. It'll make his people run. Uh, and, and so we find then that he gives us that promise. He said, you remember when the enemies of God were running from you? You remember when they had no control over you? When you were following God, they had the right meal. Verse 17. Uh, excuse me, the rest of verse 16. And they shall lay their hands upon their mouth. Now, you don't see that a lot more, but I remember the older women, when, you know, they, they, got, they first they gossip and then they go, oh. you remember that? Because they were shocked by it. Now, uh, you know what? We've got so used to sin in our country and among God's people, we don't even have the brass to be embarrassed, do we? Yeah. 
I mean, we really don't. When you look like the world and act like the world, you know what? Well, pretty much you're the world. <laughs> and uh, so we find then we, uh, <laughs> that the writer reminds them of this. You remember when sin embarrassed you? Do you remember when, when you were taken back by the way people acted? <laughs> he says they're going to put their hand over their mouth because of their fear for you. Their ears shall be deaf. And that was the enemies of God. You know, um, when I was a young preacher, it kind of bothered me when people wouldn't stay on point with me when I was preaching. And you know what? It don't bother me anymore. And the reason why, I don't mean I don't love them and not concerned about them. It only means this, is they're deaf to spiritual things. And there's not one thing I can do about that. And, and, and so... We see then as, as the Lord's people that uh, we ought to be a fearful thing in the world and instead we just crumple right up with it. Verse 17, they meaning the enemies of God and they shall lift the dust like a serpent. They shall move out of their holes like worms of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall fear because of me. Now, I want you to get that, that the reason the enemies of God were fearful were because of God's people. Now, you, you check yourself out this morning, and do you think your, your acquaintances are fearful of God because of you? I don't, I don't see that a lot anymore, do you? Uh, you know why? Because we blend it in. We look like the world, we act like the world, we're on the same task as the world. Why should they be afraid? Why should they be fearful? And, and so we find then that this was the original plan of success, if you will, was that the enemy was to be afraid of us and not the other way around. Verse 18. Who is a God like unto thee that, pardon, that pardoneth iniquity? Now we get down to kind of the root of the problem and we see the character of God that's so great and kind and wonderful. He says, he pardons iniquity. You know why Israel got into the shape that it did here uh, in, in this time? It was because of sin. And he pardons iniquity. Now, you may be in rough shape this morning. I don't know what your spiritual condition is, but this one thing I do know, we have the forgiving, loving God. The Bible says, hey, he pardoneth iniquity. Whatever situation you get in, whatever problem you're into, you know what? It's pardoned at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's pardoned by the merit of the, uh, of the sacrifice at Calvary. It is a pardoned sin. Who is God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by transgression, which is a violation of the law of God? Listen, every one of us have violated uh, the, the law of God. Do you remember the, the self-righteous rich young ruler that came unto the Lord Jesus Christ and he said, what must, what must I do to have eternal life? And he, uh, he listed out the law to him. And uh, the little rich boy said, all these I've done from my youth. Now, most certainly, he had not. You know what? You can say pretty much anything. Did you know that about your spiritual condition? Oh, yes, I'm saved. But that don't make you saved, does it? I can say that I'm six foot four. That, that don't grow me any, does it? You see what I'm saying? We can say pretty much anything. But it don't make it so. See, we, we need to get back to honesty with, with the spirit man. and Say, you know what? I don't have anything. I, I'm not what I said I was. Uh, I, I still stand in sin. And we as Lord's people need to be remember how good God has been to us. Who is God like unto thee 
that pardon in iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever. What a wonderful, wonderful, blessed truth. Now there's not a one under the sound of my voice this morning, especially the people of God, those of you that are truly saved that God has not been angry at you at times. I meant Jehovah God, God the Father, the Almighty. But Jesus came to stand in your place. And he says he, he, he ain't going to be mad for long. Why? Well, the next verse will tell us why. But have you ever thought what a fearful thing it would be to face God when he was mad at you? Yeah. To die in that instance where you denied him, now he ain't going to make you lost. But you know what the Bible says in the Old Testament? It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. Yeah. That's, that's scary, isn't it? And, and, and so we find then that the writer here says, he don't stay mad at us forever. He, he, he forgives us. Why? Because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion on us. What a wonderful, wonderful truth. How many times in my life, and I can't even begin to count and could never number how many, how many times in my life when I let him down, when I'm not served him as I should, and he comes back and, and, and reassures in my soul, yeah, you're one of mine, and there's work still to be done. I'm unfit to preach. I'm not, I, I'm not where I ought to be. But you know what? He forgives that, and he strengthens me, and he'll do it for you, too, if you cry out to him. If you have the humbleness to admit, hey, I'm in a bad shape. You know, you don't find that anymore among God's people, do you? I don't know what it is. I guess we're all doing so good that we, that we don't have to confess no more, right? No, that ain't what it is. It's ungodly pride that we possess yeah. keeps us from confessing. That, you know, pride is not a good thing. And I believe and I understand God dealt with him and made an example out of him. But you know what? Job had some spiritual problems, whether we realize it or not. Not only was he tried by Satan and God brought him through, but see, when it was all over, ever thought about them ten youngins he had that died down at his oldest brother's house? What was they doing? Having a booze party, wasn't they? But God took them all ten out just like that. You, you, you remember what Job was doing when they first came on the scene? He was an offering a sacrifice, and he was saying, it may be that my children have sinned. Right. Yeah. He knew they had. He wasn't no maybe to it. Yeah. See, he didn't have... He didn't have, he had too much pride to just simply say, laid out there before him and said, listen, God, my children are down at the oldest brother's house sinning. They're having a party. They're doing things that don't know it ought to be. And just lay it out there before God. But no, he said, maybe. And you know what? I believe about half of the judgment of Job was because of that maybe. You know what? We don't need to maybe with God. We just need to acknowledge Say, so listen, I'm in a mess, and I, I need some spiritual help. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. Now, that subdue means control. You know what, people, I, I still struggle with some things. And I don't have control of them, but God subdued them. Yeah. He, he's made them into a manageable thing because he's good, because he loves me, because he, because he wants me to be his servant. 
He subdued some things in my life. And we ought to give him praise and glory and honor for that. That's what he does for his people. He forgives them and puts them in a situation where they, where they will serve him, where they can serve him, if they will. He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have, uh, he will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. Thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Amen. What a wonderful, glorious thing. You know, uh, we don't get the understanding of this until you begin to look at a few things. You know what? There's never been any kind of ship, man-made ship, submarine, that's ever been to the bottom of spots in the ocean. Never could. And you know why? They go like this. They crumple up. They don't have the pressure to withstand it. That's where my sins have been cast into it. Place where nobody else can go. Yeah. Place where nobody else can touch. The depths of the sea. What a wonderful, wonderful blessing. They don't, they don't bother me anymore. Uh, now, I'll say this. I grieve over them, yeah. but I'm not accountable for them. You see what I'm saying? And, and that's, a that's a huge, huge difference. And so we see then that's what the Almighty has done for us. He's cast this filthy, wretched sin uh, the sins of this heart into a place where nobody can go. We're into a place where they're not remembered. In a place that, that he alone can go. My sins are in the depths of the sea. What a wonderful, wonderful blessing. Now, let me say this, lost person. Your sin has to be dealt with. Now, you can deal with it, or God can deal with it in His choosing on this side of eternity, or He can, he can, he can deal with it in the, world, in the life to come. But see, sin has to be dealt with. Every sin in the Old Testament, from the very first time when they rebelled in the garden and they didn't think uh, they had to follow the law of God, some blood sacrifice has died. And ever since then, up to the time of Christ, when he poured out his precious blood for us, the answer to sin has always been blood. Yeah. And, and so we as the Lord's people, we, we ought to rejoice in that, uh, that, that, that our iniquity has been paid for. Our sins have been set aside. We're forgiven as a people. Now go with me to the book of Psalms. Psalms 103. And I want to begin in the first verse. Psalms 103. This is a psalm of David. We'll begin reading in the very first verse. Psalms 103. David was enjoying the Lord right here. Now sometimes do you enjoy the Lord better than at other times? I certainly do. And you know, you know why I enjoy him sometimes better than others? It's because I'm, when I'm close to him, I can enjoy him better. When I'm near unto God, I can enjoy a sweet fellowship that, that's not laden with sin, but what happens when I do have sin in my life. So David was at a good point. David was in a near place unto Christ, and he begins, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Uh, you know what? How many times now? You know what? I've heard some people say stuff like that, and I don't know if they's on point or not. But you know what? When I get there with the person of Christ, bless his holy name. To God be the glory. I tell you, little blind Fred, Fanny Crosby had it right. To God be the glory. Great, great things he had done. Mm -hmm. See, you, you know what we don't? You know, I, I used to think the reason that we don't have more of that was to cause sin in our life. I don't think that anymore. I think it's because we don't experience it. Yeah. I do. I, I, I it's not because you're shy and you're bashful. 
You can't express things that way if you've never experienced them. Right? So David was at a good point in his life. Uh, now, I will say this. Just remember that David was a whoremonger and a murderer. And despite his transgression, he enjoyed God. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. You know, you know what will make you bless the Lord and make you testify this morning? You know what should make you glad in the Lord is begin to think of all his benefits. You know what? This morning, I was able to get up on my own. I went in there in the dining room, studied in on the Word of God a little bit, got up, walked down to the pasture and fed the horse and the chickens, went back up that steep hill all by myself, and, and, and then I went in there, and I was able to clean myself up, take a shower. Nobody had to help me. I, I put on my own clothes and, and fastened them up with no help at all. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Yeah. You, know, you know why we don't bless his name? It's because we don't see the blessings. We just don't. You know what? I had a, a bowl of cereal for breakfast. And you say, well, poor old Donna didn't fix you much, did she? No, I had a bowl of cereal. And you know what? It was my favorite kind. That's good, isn't it? And when I opened up the refrigerator, there's a pitcher of milk in there. I had milk to go with it. And we don't thank him enough. Then we got the family together and we got in the car. And you know what? The car started right up. Yeah. And then we drove down to the house of God. See, the reason we don't is because we don't see what we're getting. We, we don't see how good God's been to us. Because you know what? This stinking flesh, all it wants is more and more stuff. And we don't see what we've got, but David did. Verse 3, who forgiveth all thy, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who dealeth with all thy diseases. Now, two things I want you to see. Number one, he says, I'm going to bless him because he forgives my iniquities. The very one that ran with Bathsheba and got Uriah the Hittite killed very deliberately. He said, I he forgave that. Now you say, well, I haven't killed a Hittite lately. No, you ain't, but you probably thought about it. Mm -hmm. I had not laid with a woman. Well, you probably hadn't, but you may have thought about it. The yeah. Bible says, you know what the Lord Jesus said? If thou hast done it in thy heart, uh, you're still guilty. Right? And so we find then, as the Lord's people, that we need to... <coughs> We need to uh, be like David and rejoice in that forgiveness. He was rejoicing in the fact that his iniquities had been dealt with and who healeth all of thy diseases. You ever think about that? Think about Moses. You know what it says concerning Moses? That when he died at 120 years old, he was still fit as a fiddle. Said he didn't even look old. Went up there on my, you know what? He climbed to the top of Mount Moriah when he was 120 years old. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, God had God had taken care of his flesh, hadn't he? Right. You you think that you don't think Moses was ever sick? You know what? He may have been eat up with cancer, and God said, you know, cancer stop. Yeah. This is Moses you're dealing with. And, and, and for someone who's experienced divine healing, it's a precious, precious thing. Um, and you know, after my brain surgery, and I'm still very forgetful, but you know what? I can still work. I still remember my children's name and most of my grandchildren's. You see, God's good. He, he heals of diseases. He, he, he's the master over this flesh. 
And what we need to do is cry out and say, Lord, if you would, heal my body. I, I, I'm in need. Take away the disease. And I, I, I believe he's faithful to do that. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, that is a rescue, get you out of the situation, who crowned thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfied thy mouth with good things. You know, what a wonderful thing. We're fixing to go downstairs, and we're fixing to eat something, and you know what? It's going to be some good things. I know. I saw Donna fixing those pepper things, all right? And uh, I know she brought some biscuits. Had to wake up for this morning, right? <laughs> and uh, God's been good. But you know what? I've seen the flip side, and God was good then too. I've seen when it was beans. And not even beans and cornbread, just beans. <laughs> God's been good. Sure. Uh, you know what? Uh, I left with just a full belly. With beans, we, we went to a restaurant. Last night that I was done, the girls were trying to get me to go to it. And they serve all kinds of food, and the big thing is cheesecake. It's called the Cheesecake Cake Factory. And it was good. And then when we got to the cheesecake, I couldn't even eat because it was already full from what we'd already eat. And so I brought my piece home. And it was good. It really was. But it was so sweet I couldn't eat it. You know, and I was thinking, and, and I got the cheesecake part, but it was this big blob of chocolate on top. And that's the piece I was having trouble managing because it was so sweet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I finally had to throw it away. Oh. And uh, <laughs> we, we put the trash right there behind the house. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh. but I thought about how good God's been. Yeah. You know, to literally have to throw something away because you couldn't eat it, but still had it. And, 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 and so I believe David had experiences like uh, that all through his life, and he knew that the provider was God, that he had shown mercy, and that he had shown goodness, uh, who satisfied my mouth with good things, so that the, thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Now, you know, we uh, all complain about aches and pains as we get older. Well, the Bible says there that he's a renewer of stuff like that. You say, oh, that's not possible in modern day. Well, I, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. Me and uh, Sister Joanne was talking about riding bicycles, and she's ready to get her one. And uh, I said, well, I don't know how to do it anymore. My knees hurt so bad. And, uh, you know, in saying that, I was probably doubting God just a little bit. When we lived out at Dresden, me and Donna both had bikes. We had those little seats, and Adam would sit on mine, and Matthew would sit on hers. We drove all over Dresden, the bikes. And, uh, you know what? He could renew that if we trusted him. Uh, if we had faith. But we've been convinced of the world that you have these little compartments in life and middle age you start going down the hill. And we've kind of we've kind of bought into that, ain't we? But see, the Bible says that our God is a, a sustainer. One that keeps on. One that uh, there's a church up in Marion, Kentucky, Central Baptist Church of Marion. And um, there's this family that used to make up the whole church. There's a few of them still there. Last name Cox. And I never knew the, the daddy of the clan. I knew uh, Minus and John. That was his sons. And when I met them, they was old. But their daddy preached his last sermon at 102. See, God is a sustainer, is he not? And he didn't he died not too long after that, but you know, he went and crawled up in a ball somewhere. He died during the night in his sleep. Put himself to bed that night. See, God's good. Uh, he's a sustainer. 
And, and a lot of times the reason we don't see that is simply we don't claim it. <laughs> and and we, we don't really believe that God is able to do what this book promised that, that he would do. So David understood that. The Lord executed righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. Now, I want you to see, the Bible says in verse 7, he, he made his ways known, his character to Moses. Now, when they held it out of Egypt, there was a four and a half million of them. And uh, I believe probably three or four were genuinely saved. And the reason Moses understood the character of God, it said that here that he told him. See, uh, in your new little 1 and 2 and 3 prayer, you, you, you know what the problem with that is? There's no place for the revealing of who God is. Except that you're a sinner. Hey, listen, it don't matter whether you accept it or not, you're a sinner. Yeah. Right? And, and, and so we see then that the Lord's people ought to be able <laughs> to rejoice in the fact when, <laughs> when he meets with us and says, this is who I am. He's not made his ways known to Moses, not everybody. Uh, there, there were two others that probably had salvation. <laughs> Joseph was one of uh, their names have left me, but I don't have much confidence. I don't have any confidence in Miriam. Miriam wanted Moses' job, didn't she? And so uh, we find then we ought to praise our salvation, pray to God for our salvation, because we find in verse 7 it's a revealed truth. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. Now, I want you to see verse 9. It says he won't always chide. Now, he will chide. Yeah. It just won't go on forever. And, and, and what's the difference between a whipping and a chiding? A chiding is when you give your child and you say, You know what, Joey? I told you not to do this because if you do, you're going to get hurt. That's correction with the reason behind it. Well, you know why we shouldn't be a whoremonger? Because it makes a mockery of the things of God. You know why we shouldn't boo booze it up every Saturday night and then come into the house of God? Because it makes a mockery. And so that's when you correct your children and tell them why. And, and he said, I'm not going to do that forever because I love you and I desire fellowship with you and I'm merciful and I'm good. But he does correct us and boy, do we need it. <laughs> Verse 10. He had not dealt with us after our sins and not after many post-sin, following sin. He means... I didn't, I didn't punish you with what the law said to punish you with. You remember when they found that woman who was taken in adultery in the ministry of Christ? And the Bible says, in the very act. Now, I wanted to know who, who went to her house and, and, and looked for that to start with. But you know what? The Bible don't address that. And I wondered about the man that was jumped up in there with her. Bible don't say anything about that, but you know what? If they had followed the law, those self-righteous, ungodly Jews, if they had followed the law, they had both of them out there. But they jumped on this little woman and should we stone her? Do we need to stone her? That's what the law says. Do we need to stone her? And remember the Lord Jesus Christ wants to say a word to them. He said that he sat down and started writing in the sand. And then they, high, they jumped on him again and said, Hey, what are we going to do with this? He looked up and said, Hey, that is without sin, cast the first stone. And he got down there and he started writing some more. 
now walked away. And he looked at the woman and says, where are my accusers? And she says, they've all left. He said, I forgive thee, go and sin no more. You ever wonder what he wrote? Maybe it was forgiven. I don't know. Now, look, if we get to ask questions in glory, I, that's one I'm going to ask. And, uh, but he forgave her. You know, what, what a wonderful thought this morning that we that are saved are forgiven and we're not under the penalty of the law anymore. What, what a glorious thing. Verse 11. For as high as heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. So his mercy goes from here on the earth all the way high, high, high above the heavens. Now, I want you to see that says heavens plural. Do, do you know how many heavens, according to the Bible, there is? Three. The Bible says that, that John was caught up into the, the third heaven. Yeah. I personally believe that the he first heaven is what we can see. It's cloudy today. And uh, the heaven above that is the atmospheric heaven where the plants dwell, I mean, excuse me, the planets dwell and the stars. And above that, I believe it's the bowl of God. And he says, Mom, his mercy extends from down here all the way up to the abode of God. And that's just as far as you can get it. What, what a wonderful, merciful God we serve. And why don't we worship Him? And why don't we praise Him like we ought to? I, I don't understand it. But we should. We should give Him great, great, great praise and great glory every day. And then my favorite, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far He removed our transgressions from us. So one place said, I passed him in the depths of the sea. And another one said, I passed him as far as the east is from the west. They're gone. They're done with. You know what? This morning, if you have an excuse why you are not serving God, let it go. Set it aside. Uh, because, see, the, this, is, the, this is the thing. Your sins are not there no more. That's right. Don't let there be a hang-up to you. Right. Don't, don't say, I can't. Because you know what? You can. Don't say, well, you don't know what I've done. Well, it doesn't matter. You know what? I don't need to know. That's right. Amen. Right. Right. They're in the depths of the sea. Right. You're not going to find them. So why do we get so burdened down? Because we do not claim that truth. We don't. Say, oh, I remember this and I remember that. So. So. We need to claim that truth this morning, do we not? We know that our sins are in the depths of the sea. Amen. We're never to have to be dealt with again. Amen. Amen. You know, on the merit of Christ, I anticipate, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. Not, not because of what I've done, because of what he's done. Enter ye in into the glories of the Lord. What a, what a wonderful time that's going to be. Walking up and down the streets of God. Listen, at that time, <laughs> we'll put off this Baptist self-righteousness and we'll have a party like there's never been. Praising God throughout the ceaseless ages. Giving Him great glory and power for who He is.